So here we are in the shadow of the European headquarters for some of the biggest banks in the world. It's ironic considering how financially forward we are thinking. And we have, unfortunately, some <laughs> banks which have been engaged in, in practices such as money laundering $800 million for the Sinaloa cartel and other narco terrorists. It's funny to think because so much of what, what we're doing is trying to provide more transparency to the, the financial world. It's crazy because, you know, HSBC, speaking of them, they're actually cutting off corporate accounts for crypto companies, including one of the experiences I personally had with just to distribute salaries to employees. So who are they to claim legitimacy is, is the question that I have for them. And eventually, do you think one day we'll have a Ethereum or a Cardano logo replacing one of those banking logos? Maybe a Coinbase? <laughs> yeah, Coinbase. You know, maybe some big exchange, like, or maybe Swissborg. Oh, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> Cross fingers. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to season five of Kryptonites, special edition London and Canary Wharf. We have some of the original gangsters of the crypto space and on top of that, a new format where you can earn crypto in every single show, plus earn swag and more. So don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and let's have some fun. <laughs> some of the biggest banks are money laundering for the Sinaloa cartel. And so much of what we're doing is trying to provide more transparency to the financial world. We're going to see a surge in interest in smart contract platforms. It's going to be an interesting market. NFTs coming from everyone. Everyone's dropping NFTs. So anyone now today still not sure about Bitcoin? You're fucking mad. <laughs> In a fast-moving and confusing crypto asset market, get an edge with Crypto Slate Edge. Enhanced in-depth news coverage and extensive crypto asset and sector data are all part of your exclusive access as a member, helping you understand the market with features such as on-chain metrics and sentiments, all of which allow you to convert knowledge into action with an ad-free experience. As a bonus, access our private Telegram channel to receive live insights whilst engaging with the CryptoSlate community. Subscribe now at CryptoSlate.com forward slash edge. Hey Crypto fam, our next guest is Nate from Crypto Slate, a personal friend and a genuinely good person with tons of knowledge as he has to create news and content in the crypto space every single day. So I really hope you guys enjoy it. And don't forget to download the Swissborg Wealth app because you can get best execution by connecting to multiple exchanges plus the best risk return automated farming products at the tip of your fingers. Have a blast, guys. So, Nate, man, I must say, and I love spending time with you. We had a bit of a bromance for the past months here Absolutely. during the lockdown, and so happy to have you. Bring us back to Nate at age 11. I know you have a really cool story to share with everybody. Yeah, so I've always been a fan of technology, and I'm lucky that I had parents that really kind of nurtured my passion for that. Back when I was 11 years old, my dad would take me to CompUSA, the old computer store in America, you take me there on a pretty regular basis. I would pick up books about programming. I would uh, just try to learn how to build websites. And that, that was kind of the beginning of my interest in creating things on the internet, creating actual web pages and websites. And then a few years later, obviously, you know, 20 years later, <laughs> I, uh, my grandpa was a stock trader. So I always kind of had that like financial interest in my, my DNA. So by the time, uh, 2015 rolled around. I had a, a really good buddy in Seattle who's a, a hedge fund manager tell me to download this little app called Coinbase. Yeah. <laughs> so at the time, you know, Bitcoin was around 270 bucks. I downloaded the, the Coinbase app and I realized, oh, wow, this is, this is something different. This is something interesting. It's not like a stock. It's something that I can just, you know, buy right now and then have custody of, at the time was around three Bitcoin. So that kind of started really what was the the deep dive into the rabbit hole which which i really think is much more of like a black hole because <laughs> the the crypto world is inescapable as a black hole is for any object that that is uh, orbiting it so by the time i actually uh started you know acquiring bitcoin and learning more about it i was going on reddit i was going on forums i was trying to figure out like well, what is going on in the space why is this so different uh, another really funny thing at the time 
was uh, one of the Bitcoin core developers, a guy named Mike Hearn. He actually wrote a really scathing kind of op-ed about why he's leaving the Bitcoin community. He thought Bitcoin was a failed project back in, in 2015. A another one of my, my kind of you know, entrepreneurial heroes at the time, a guy named Matt Mullenweg, who was the founder of WordPress, they actually decided to discontinue accepting Bitcoin for, for WordPress donations. So it didn't look very good in 2015. The Bitcoin community at that point was, was really waiting you know, for the past two years for another, another bull run. But obviously over the next you know, six to, to 18 months, the price of Bitcoin started to increase again. And that really brought in much more of the, the mainstream kind of retail. Another thing that was huge at the time was uh, Ethereum was starting to become more of a well-known cryptocurrency, especially as Coinbase added it. So I decided that if, if Coinbase is going to list something, I need to acquire it. So I started buying Ethereum when it, when it got on Coinbase in, in 2016 or so. And, and that was kind of a, a new interest, a new, a new passion for what can Bitcoin do? Well, it can do digital money very well, but Ethereum can do a lot more. That's so cool, man. It really sounds like the perfect like cocktail mix kicked off with engineering, then learned about finance and always involved with the family. That's so cool that your entire family is looking at this space as well. And obviously Crypto Slate, right? Which is to me a massive success story because if you fast forward from those years all the way to 2021, I believe this year you hit 1 million unique visitors in a single month. Tell us about Crypto Slate. What is the purpose, the vision, the mission, anything that you want to share? Yeah, so Crypto Slate was really conceived because of my like fascination and my my interest in learning as much as I could. I, I realized once I got into crypto in, in 2015 that I was spending a huge amount of my time on on two types of sites. One was like a data site like CoinMarketCap, and the other was on some of the news websites like Cointelegraph and CoinDesk. So I realized that there was actually at the time no website, no kind of single unified experience for getting the the qualitative side, meaning the news and some of the analysis, and the quantitative side, meaning the, the actual data of what's happening. So the idea was to create a website that focused on both. So really like a discoverability engine for the news, the, the analysis, the opinion even, with also the cryptocurrency prices, all the data that's happening. And that's how Crypto Slate was born. I wanted to have all the news and all the data in one location. That is super cool. And since you're talking about data, I'd love to ask you a tricky question, but you know, amongst communities, it's always good to see how active communities are. Like based on your experience with Crypto Slate, what are some of the biggest and most loyal communities in the crypto space? Definitely crypto is like one of the most kind of tribal worlds in terms of someone holds one coin and then they hate all the other competitor coins. Um, it, it, there's, there's good things and there's bad things about that. One of the bad things is that I think people become overly attached to their bags. So for example, the Ripple community, they, they hold on to their bags until it goes to zero. And because they believe one day that you know, Ripple will see a lot more appreciation from banks or, or other kind of financial settlements type, uh, starting to use the Ripple technology. Um, but overall, I think that one needs to be as open-minded as possible when in the crypto space because there's so much new information coming at us at a regular basis. So to be able to really not just have an opinion that, okay, I hold this cryptocurrency, it's the best cryptocurrency, but I hold this cryptocurrency, what could potentially disrupt my cryptocurrency? So I think that's a, it's a good idea to, to take a kind of, com, do a competitive analysis in a way in which one is okay with buying competitors of your favorite cryptocurrency. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And what would be the ideal scenario, the ideal mindset, you know, to kind of move away from this tribalistic, you know, like tendency that we're seeing now? Um, I think in the in the most ideal world, people wouldn't think about cryptos so much as religions, which I think that that's what we kind of notice is that there is, even though we're all in this together in the sense that we want crypto to succeed, we believe this is the new financial revolution that there can't be so much infighting. There really is, cryptocurrency has many culture wars that exist within it. So by, by being open to new ideas, by being open to new teams, new technologies, uh, different types of uh, kind of iterations of accomplishing the same goal, 
it, it makes it a lot easier to, to not think about your, your, your bags, so to speak, as, as your religion. Prize question of the week, my friends. If you could be any type of cryptocurrency, what would it be? Tell us why in the comment section and you might be the lucky winner. So the Ripple XRP community is very strong. They tend to move together, you know, like brothers on Twitter and et cetera, et cetera. And um, I'll tell you, I remember you telling me one day that Cardano had a very strong community. Are there any other communities based on the data that you access where you think, wow, they have proper backing or a proper community like following them in every single footstep. Yeah, so Cardano is, is actually one example where when we do a Cardano article, it actually will get oftentimes more views than, than a Bitcoin article, which tells me that there is a, a lot of loyal Cardano supporters that they, they think Cardano is, is the future of a smart contract platform. Um, other, than, other than Cardano, it's been, it's been interesting to see this year how, how Dogecoin has exploded so much and there are now so many kind of doge influencers um there there's even a youtuber who just he only talks about dogecoin so that i mean dogecoin is another topic entirely but in, in my opinion dogecoin doesn't really serve a purpose right now other than it purely being a meme coin and, and i think in the future we will see more memes come into cryptocurrency in, in a way in which people get attached to their memes as they get attached to crypto and that's where they want to put their money. And I couldn't agree more with you, like Nate, like, you know, earlier on this year, like maybe January, even end of last year, when you looked at the top 50 by market cap, you would start realizing that relative to 2017 or 18, wow, the top 50 has many legitimate projects. But once we started reaching, you know, March, you know, around that area, we started seeing all these meme coins, which like you said, has real no purpose besides being a fork or copy paste from another smart contract. Does that worry you? Do you feel like we were starting to mature, but then again, we went back to having a bit of an immature market and not looking necessarily credible uh, in front of the more traditional people? How did you take that whole meme coin thing? Yeah, that's really, I look at that as kind of retail mania. So in every single cycle, there, there's different kind of, there's different parts of it. There's obviously the accumulation section that's usually kind of more silent buying. It, it may be a little bit of institutions, but Mostly it's just the actual cryptocurrency faithful or, or the traders who are accumulating slowly over time. And then once the price starts to go up, that, that may actually be some institutional buying. We created a, a meme coins listing, uh, like aggregate listing on, on CryptoSlate to track all meme coins. We were one of the, the first entities that, that show all meme coins. Really? Yeah, yeah. So we have a, like a, a market index basically for meme coins. For meme coins. Yeah. So if you type meme coins into Google, we're in the top. Like, I mean, even like coin market cap, like yeah. the the top ten trending tokens yeah. in the past few weeks, seven out of ten are meme coins. Man, yeah. when I see that, I'm like, oh my god, we still haven't ended the euphoria. Oh yeah, it's crazy. When I first got into into crypto, the market cap of the entire market was around 15 billion, and just in this cycle, Shiba Inu hit about a 15 billion dollar market cap by itself. <laughs> 15 billion for Shiba Inu, man. Yeah. But do you think like, uh, that's just, first of all, it just blows me away. Even now around 2 billion uh, Shiba Inu, is just, I just really don't make get sense. anything of what it's doing. But um, why do you think people are investing in these meme coins? I've asked a few friends, some they're like, oh, it's just for fun. I want to gamble, you know, it's a, it's a cool thing to do. But what do you think, is it a way for people to express kind of like an FU? to all the traditional guys and, and see finance from a different angle. What do you think, is, what are the motives for people to invest in these crazy meme coins? I think the number one motive is they wanna make money. So it, it's much more of this concept of, I wanna make as much money as quickly as possible. As quickly as and possible. I look at the coin that's gone up the most. And that's not really the right way to look at investing in crypto. One wants to look at what is undervalued. So if, if Dogecoin is up 100X, that's not a good time to get in on it. Yeah. The, the right time to get in is when no one else is really talking about it and you do enough research to have some sort of insight about the long-term trajectory. But so much of crypto, especially on the retail side, is they want to make as much money as quickly as possible. And that's just not the right way to be in this market over a long enough period of time. That's crazy. I remember seeing like some private chats on Telegram where they they were actually saying Shiba Inu is going to get listed on Binance and sending all these signals for people to just keep on pumping the token. But I never got in. Just like you said, I'm not interested in the pump. I'm I'm here for the long term, sustainable coins and tokens. Do you believe a lot of these meme coins will end up going to zero in the next year, two years, or three years from now? Oh, absolutely. Over time, enough of the coins that don't have 
enough developers or enough of uh, the community is one thing, but there needs to actually be iteration on the development side, like the actual people who are building the the cryptocurrencies themselves or, or building the platforms which they exist on. If if there are enough people that are well funded enough over a long enough period of time, those cryptocurrencies could emerge victorious. But even that, it's it's hard to say. Like, which cryptocurrencies that or which projects have half a billion dollars of money in the bank that they, that can sustain themselves for for multiple decades? Will they be able to really realize what their vision is? And and even then, that's not a surefire thing. The biggest thing that, that I take into consideration when getting into any cryptocurrency or advising anyone else getting into an, any cryptocurrency is what is the product market fit and is it possible given their resources currently that they can achieve that over a several year period. Yeah, that makes sense. And you dropped so many gems, Nate, you know, talking about finding the, the actual tokens and projects they're building, they're developing that seem undervalued relative to the value they're, proper, they're actually offering to the markets. And that kind of brings me to the next question. Obviously, we're just talking about meme coins, which I guess we agree that it's, it was kind of like the top of euphoria, you know, the top of the bull market. Especially with Elon on SNL pumping does. <laughs> Oh my God, yeah, that was... That, that was the top. <laughs> that was the top, right? Yeah. That was the top. I mean, it's funny because the previous cycle, it's kind of like my hairdresser was talking about Dogecoin just a few months ago, which is a one sign or friends randomly calling me, which coin should I buy? Or the Uber driver. Or the Uber driver and yeah. stuff like that. But the meme coins for me was even worse than than you know, actual people or friends who don't know finance or tech calling me up to and asking me which coin or token should I buy right now. Um, but. Looking at what is happening right now, that kind of created some sort of, some believe it's a bear market, some believe, oh, it's not a bear market, it's just consolidation. What is your opinion? How long would, could this potentially last? And what do you think will be the catalyst for the next bull run? So one of my favorite quotes is, when in doubt, zoom out. We're already up a lot from what were the, the 20, 2020 lows, which is really on you know the, the Black Friday, the March 13th incident where Bitcoin went down to 3,800. We're, we're way up from that. Obviously, having the, the pandemic, everyone was you know sitting inside for an entire year. The amount of hyperinflation that was occurring, it, it was clear that that crypto was going to be the the one of the go-to asset classes for for new people. I, I saw an interview uh, recently of Mila Kunis, who was on Conan, talking about she was. She was sitting indoors and she was wondering what she's going to do with all this free time she has. So she started her own NFT. And, and, and I think that's true for a lot of people who they, di they just didn't know what to do with their time. So they just bought digital internet money. So I think absolutely the, the amount of people that didn't have anything better to do during this, this crazy pandemic and the amount of hyperinflation that was occurring, that, that really precipitated the rise to, to yeah. Bitcoin's 65K high. Uh, right around the time the Coinbase listed. However, where we're at now, I, I see two scenarios. One scenario is that we're kind of similar to what was happened in 2017 and 2013 um, to the previous all-time highs, the previous bull markets, where in the middle of the year, there was actually like a pretty big drop followed by a kind of another parabolic increase to, to finish the year. So some people think that Bitcoin could finish the year 80K to 100K. Other people think that, okay, we're gonna go back into another 80 to 90% correction. I'm kind of 50-50. 50-50. Yeah. I think that if we do have a bear market, it will, it will be a shorter bear market than previous bear markets, which have been in, in the two to three year region. So where we go from now, I, for, the, for the sake of Crypto Slate, trying to be as objective as possible, yeah. I don't like to actually make predictions, yeah. but I do, I do kind of make probabilistic uh, predictions as far as who knows? It could be could go a lot higher, could go a lot lower. Only a crystal ball would tell Only us. Only a crystal ball would tell yeah. us, right? And yeah. that's why I think we we're talking about this earlier that we should never trust one guy who predicted one correction because even if they're right once, they're never right all the time, right? Yep. They tend to mess up all the other predictions. And it's funny, like like you mentioned, you know, as for me, as soon as I saw, you know, people calling Bitcoin at 18k, 15k, you know, just a month and a half ago, you know, it's crazy. We, we, we're we so emotional, right? We're either overly optimistic or whoa, we swim to overly pessimistic. And when I saw those 15 to 18, you know, predictions, I'm like, okay, we're getting irrational again. Uh, you know, this Bitcoin has so such strong fundamentals. But what do you think would be the next catalyst? Do you think, you know, some people say it's second layer solutions, scaling solutions. Some people say proof of stake chains coming out. Uh, will it be Bitcoin that drags the entire crypto space again? Forwards. It's, I know, of course, we can't predict 
anything perfectly, but what would it, what could be some scenarios? So similar to what happened last year, we had DeFi summer where we had Wi-Fi and Compound kind of kick off this yeah. like DeFi revolution where everyone was like, okay, let's go in all in on DeFi. And, and that, that did sort of precede Bitcoin obviously going much higher in October, November, December of 2020. So some people predict a, a DeFi summer 2.0 uh, that kind of is on the, the back of the, the layer two scaling solutions. Um, other people think that Bitcoin needs to have its public persona changed in a way from being environmentally harmful to being much more of a green friendly cryptocurrency. And that could allow more public companies to actually begin allocating again to Bitcoin because as we know, Bitcoin is, it's hard money, it's fixed supply. There's lots of reasons why one would wanna hold Bitcoin over, over fiat currency or, or over dollar or over gold. Uh, so two things uh, I see as the potential catalysts, but it's, who knows? <laughs> who knows, man, who knows? But what I know is you are an awesome guy and such a breath of fresh air. And so many people are driven by self-interest, by greed, but you're a generally good person. And all the bromance situations that we've had here in Canary Wharf and beautiful London has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for being a brother. Likewise, thanks for having me, sir. Nate, this looks like the hoverboard from Back to the Future. What the hell is this thing? This thing is called a one wheel. It's probably one of the, the most fun personal mobility devices that exists nowadays. I've had one wheels for the past four years since the last bull run of 2017. I put about 4,000 miles on four different 4, one wheels. 4,000 yeah. miles on this one wheel, that's yeah. so crazy. But it's man. one of the few things that I, I do that I don't think about work, I don't think about crypto. I'm just focused on the task at hand, not getting injured and having a good time. <laughs> It's like the combination of a GTA and real life type simulation, right? It oh, looks so trippy. Absolutely. So tell me, man, you're from Seattle. Why the hell did you come here to, to London, to the UK? What made you like think this is the place to be? So London being a financial hub and being a really a technology hub, and also some would say even a media hub, London's one of the best places for Crypto Slay to operate. So I came to London because I wanted to be in what I thought was the best energy, the best crypto energy in all of Europe. And London being one of the biggest cities for in the Western world, I knew like this was the place to be. This is where the right crypto energy is. That's amazing, man. And as you said, we have everything here in London, right? From the OGs contributing to the Bitcoin code, to marketers, to YouTubers, to traders, we got it all here, right? Crypto media, lots of crypto media, yeah. Yeah! <laughs> Woo!